So rebound is the idea that when we introduce an energy efficiency gain, that we actually reduce energy less than we think we will. So in an economy, you introduce a certain percentage energy efficiency gain and sort of naively would expect that energy use would go down by that amount, but that's not what happens. So that's rebound. So this substitution of elasticity, all it means is that, that the degree of this rebound phenomenon depends on how flexible the economy, economy is. So this, I mean, this is all theoretical stuff. And, but, you know, I was thinking economic theory, while it, while it rests on kind of idealized pictures of the economy and economic situation, ec economic situations, nonetheless points a very reliable finger usually at very powerful economic forces at work. So my curiosity got me going, <clears throat> set down to try to establish a, a, formal, <clears throat> a formal theoretical framework uh, for this phenomenon on the way to trying to create a basis for empirical analysis that we could trust to be rigorous and kind of extract the most we could out of the data that we have available. But I really got going just by accident and then after that um, curiosity took off. The implications for climate change policy of rebound are basically two. First is that if you look at the Kyoto Protocols and the agreements internationally that countries are reaching about, you know, committing to certain emissions levels, to the extent that they're counting on energy efficiency to get them most of that way, they stand the chance of falling far short. So that's, that's important. The second implication that's more important is that the models that are generally used for forecasting use in policy, climate change mitigation policy, for forecasting energy use, <clears throat> routinely ignore this rebound effect or at minimum treat it very inadequately. So the implication of that is to the extent that these forecasts of future energy use are understating how much energy use will be in the future and how fast it will grow, it means we have less time than we think to devise climate change solutions less time to put in place these to bring on the supply side abundant cheap, uh, less time on the supply side to bring cheap, abundant, and clean energy to replace it. That's already a huge challenge to do it in the time frame we think. But now with rebound, it becomes a much more urgent task. It's less a, an issue of what makes up the supply side. <clears throat> The, so what, it, what makes up the supply side will depend on, you know, new technology and, and how fast we can develop it. The problem is, what is the amount of energy demand that will be needed? And the simple-minded thought is that, well, if we have these energy efficiency gains, we'll need less of whatever supply provides it. But the implication of rebound is that we'll need a lot more of everything <laughs> and sooner than we think we will. It's real similar to the problems faced by climatologists because climatology is a science, but it's not a science like physics is science because climatologists can't say take the global climate, run it for five years under one set of conditions, and then go back and rerun it under a different set of conditions. So the problem is this lack of a scientifically controlled experiment for climate means that it opens the door to people who feel free to ignore the indirect 
scientific evidence for climate change. So in economics, we have the same problem, is that we need to rely on models of kind of what would have happened or what will happen. You need to devise scenarios that say, now, if this rebound effect eats up, you know, if rebound is 100%, that is, if I introduce an energy efficiency gain and uh, it doesn't change my energy use, that's one trajectory. Another one is if it takes in kind of the same mental model that normally what people would think of, it takes on a one-for-one -one basis. You need to devise models that allow you to depict those. Then look at historically where energy use was, and that gives you an idea of rebound. The main thing about understanding rebound is that, you know, it, it seems to make a whole lot of sense you know, the rational mind says, if I introduce uh, energy efficiency gain of X percent, I should see that energy demand goes down by X percent below where it otherwise would have been. I mean, that's just, that sort of makes sense. But that's not, unfortunately, the way the economy really works. You, because the economy is flexible, um, when you introduce an energy efficiency gain, the, econ the economy is very adaptable and flexible in how it accommodates energy efficiency gains. It's not passive. Uh, it's flexible and creative. So consumers, for example, when an energy efficiency gain is introduced, they, they are flexible. They adjust their consumption patterns. Producers do the same energy efficiency gain occurs, they adjust their production, they have a lot of flexibility to do that, and the result is that energy use is higher than what, would, what we think would make sense. In Europe, it's, um, you know, pretty much uh, the debate about it is, is over. In the U.S., it's um, been a little disappointing because there's a big resistance among the environmental community to this idea. And I think it's partly because, um, I mean, these are, these are very bright people. They're not, they're, you know, PhDs in physics. They're no dummies, okay? But the analysis so far seems to be fairly shallow, and I think there's a kind of a certain zealotry that's come into it that's, uh, I think, has its root in, in resisting the idea that energy efficiency gains increase economic welfare, and energy efficiency gains, you know, uh, there's a trade-off there. They increase economic welfare, but they don't decrease energy use as much as you would think they do. They'd like to have it both ways. They'd like to say we can in increase energy efficiency, keep our economic welfare exactly where it is, and have lower energy demand. And the idea of it being a trade-off there um, creates some heartburn in, in among U.S. environmentalists. The low-hanging fruit may not be so low-hanging after all. Um, if you look at the projections of the International Energy Agency and uh, the models relied on by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they see, the International Energy Agency, for example, sees, you know, 30% of the solution over the next several years will come from energy efficiency, but it's, it's, it, it's not so low-hanging fruit. Examples um, in the UK, for example, introducing insulation into homes uh, has had the effect, because so many of the homes are leaky and, and, and so forth, has had the effect of actually enabling people to heat more rooms to a higher temperature. Mm. Uh, there's been a re the recent uh, study in Germany that people tend to drive more when they have you know, uh, more efficient vehicles in Germany, even the high end uh, of the market, 
so that 50%, I think they're saying 70% in Germany of the gains that you would think you'd get are eroded away. There's an important distinction here between kind of end use energy use, you know, what we use in our homes and for personal transportation. There we think these rebound effects are likely smaller. Um, but the important part of this is that most of the energy we all consume is not consumed in our homes and for personal transportation. Globally, two-thirds of the energy that we use is embedded in the goods and services, you know, what I eat, what I wear. Two-thirds of the energy used is, goes into the production of the goods and services we use. So we don't think that that's where the majority of our energy consumption is coming from, but that's where you and I uh, consume the vast bulk of our energy. And there, the mechanisms are, are quite different. You in, uh, firms that find new ways to, or uh, new energy efficiency solutions can adjust all their input and output products in a way that's more flexible to, to maximize their profits. Prices drive through the economy to other producers and ultimately to final consumers in a very complex way. And energy use changes all along the way. There's, and that leads, what we're seeing in, in that part of the economy <clears throat> are very substantial um, rebounds. They're just, they're harder to see. And there's a third category that's maybe as important, and this, this category really uh, is called the, um, the frontier effects. And I think Jesse Jenkins, that, that breakthrough, uh, uh, invented that term. But the idea is that energy efficiency might enable whole new products, applications, and even whole new industries. So an example of that is is lighting. There was a group at uh, Sandia that did a study over 300 years of new lighting technologies. What they discovered was that the efficiency gains were almost exactly set off, offset over 300 years by the rise of new applications for lighting. Or think of your laptop. I mean, 100 years ago when I was an undergraduate student, we used to uh, go to a computer center. Mainframe computer, climate controlled room, lots of power cables, huge energy hog. And its ability to, to, to compute was, you know, its floating, uh, uh, floating point operations per second and bytes moved per second was a tiny fraction of your laptop, what it can do now. Your laptop is way more powerful than those mainframe computers. And it uses one heck of a lot less energy, you know, tiny fraction of the energy. But then you look and you say, well, how many laptops are there in the world compared to the mainframes <laughs> that used to be there? And what's the total energy use of those? And, you know, would we have laptops, how many people would use laptops if they used the same amount of energy that an old mainframe did? So these energy efficiency gains at least help to enable potentially whole new industries and that will also increase energy use.